Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Laura Dodge, the head book buyer for Forbidden Planet, and today we are joined by Jay McGuinness to talk about Blood Flowers. Thank you for having me. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we managed to sort this out because your schedule is somewhat hectic. It's, it's a bit bouncy right now. <laughs> I'm going to be hopping on a train straight after this. But that this is, is a nice stop off for me. That good, good. And you're it's suitably impressed with the I mean the, the morning I've had. Is it morning? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Walking around looking at these is brilliant. It's just endlessly fascinating this stuff. So yeah, we have well we're nearly fifty years old, Forbidden Planet, yeah. which is crazy. So yeah, there's there's a lot of history in this world. I told you I've been watching the Buffy series yes. and you've got everyone just right down there. I know. I'm on series know. six. I won't give things away for the people that don't no, want spoilers no, in a show that's 20 years yeah, old. people have got to catch up with Buffy yeah. if they haven't already. Um, now normally we have a wall of books behind but all the books are at the store because we're heading there straight after yes. this. So uh, worry not anyone at home there will be signed copies <laughs> available very soon. Um, so, what can you tell us about your debut? What I can tell you is, uh, it's definitely not an autobiography, which I thought was clear I saw that last year. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought I was clear on that, but I've even had friends recently say, oh, is it out then? And said, like, what, what part of your life are you talking about? I was like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about witches and <laughs> magic and, and all that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it's based on uh, a young boy called Bear he lives in Calliston and he wants to succeed in all the conventional ways that sort of a, a fantasy young uh, teen wants to succeed. Mm. The ways that his town tells him he should. The town cultivate these red flowers called Sinsen mm -hmm. and he thinks that's his, his path in life to get to the top. But once he just starts to succeed, he finds like often, I think people do find, when you go into those very powerful rooms, the people maybe aren't as nice as you thought they would be or as noble or even as smart. Maybe some of them are, but um, sort of his uh, his worldview sort of comes crashing down. And during the process, he finds out that there's a lot more going on in his town than he thinks. Mm -hmm. That's my little blurb. That's your little How did blurb. I do? That's pretty good. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I know there's been a lot of comparisons to Hunger Games and Divergent and a lot of the kind of uh, classic dystopian novels. For me, there were kind of um, elements of, I don't know if you've ever read The Final Strife, Sarah, Sarah Arifi's like, debut that came out uh, two, three years ago with Harper Voyager. And um, it's kind of a kind of Afro-inspired dystopian, and it, it has the idea of the, the different kind of sets of the society. And so. Right. But there's there's such a richness in your world that oh, it kind you. of, it it's kind of up there with some of the like best epic fantasy that's out at the so like where where did the idea all come from like well i mean i really started with the setting like mm. when someone said what was the start of the story was it a plot point a character i thought no i had to base it on what i knew and my world was like a small market town mm. so where i'm from is newark on trent and then especially touring like with the boys but also now with this play um you see so many i'm like oh this is a carbon copy of my mm. market town that's hundreds or thousands of years old and they're just like sort of sleepy towns on the edge of a train line somewhere. And I remember as a kid just thinking about like going to the city one day and maybe I'll do this. And mm. like, it's such a formative thing to think that you're not really living life yet. Mm. You, you're waiting for like, I mean, I think everyone probably thinks that. Mm. But for me, it was all about creating the feeling that I had, not just as a kid when I read books and I loved being taken into another world, but also the feeling I had where I knew my place, not just in like, a grand societal way but also like I had you know like family members that were every generation sort of guiding me through and this is what you do and everywhere you go everyone knows your business and your gossip mm. and 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 you know theirs and you're really like in this community together that's a really fun thing when it's doesn't you know impact you personally mm. when it, you're reading about someone else you're like oh my god I can't believe they said that in the tavern <laughs> versus going in the pub and being like oh my god everyone knows what happened last night <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think I just wanted to create that community feeling, but in a, in a magical world. Mm. That's what I was going for. Yeah. Do you get to go home very often and kind of re-experience <laughs> that community feel? Yeah, and, and a lot of it actually is, is based around like pubs. Mm. So like my family are like working class, mostly from Ireland and Scotland. And um, we used to go to the Irish Centre after church or after whatever, whatever like, event and we go to a social club and there'd be like little old ladies dancing with their husbands and Irish music and everyone would be drinking and I'd be there with my four siblings sat on these like red chairs 
I'm just watching them all. I mean, like, oh my God, <laughs> they're getting crazy. You know, you know, when when adults drink in front of children, it's really I found it really exciting as a child because mm. I find my parents saying silly things to us, and <laughs> and then sometimes it's scary. So mm. he's got too drunk, and that man's doing this. And I think that, uh, like, without meaning to, with these red flowers in this book, they've ended up becoming me sort of exploring how much do we need as like the UK as a society mm. to to have drinks at every single social gathering and are they good for us mm. because i know that we're quite a repressed society and we're quite a polite society i think because you don't want to encroach on other people so we've like got used to like using alcohol as a tool to like you know yes. ping us into a social mm -hmm. setting and i definitely did that during the wanted a lot i felt, mm. found myself in circumstances where i didn't feel qualified to be there and meeting all kinds of people that are like literally gracing the shells in front mm. of me and i just thought oh my gosh i'm doing the same sort of crutch crutching that you know generations of people in the uk have been doing forever just to try and get by mm. and i don't think it serves me you know i'd rather just be able to turn up and be myself yeah you know which i think the wanted was a really good learning lesson for that mm. and you know we forged really really lifelong bonds but i also think that some of those tools that we used were like, just completely destructive mm. yeah i think i think as well with the the whole kind of coming of coming of age kind of story with Claire and like you said in your own life you just it takes a while to find yourself yeah. and the fact that you obviously found fame quite young that's yeah. that's kind of a bit of a mindfuck it does it totally <laughs> yeah. is a mindfuck you don't think so at the time you just no. think you're having the time of your life and you think you're exploring the world and new things and you don't realize at the time that you're probably learning a lot more about yourself as you mm. go but i also in this book because in my mind it's, just, it's the start of three there is potential for more but i have three set in my head mm -hmm. and at the start i just wanted because as a kid i was really adamant i'm never going to smoke and i'm only going to drink a little bit mm -hmm. um and, and and then during this book bear is adamant that he's never going to drink because he's had really traumatic experiences with something that happened in his childhood and so he's kind of sworn off it in the same way that i was mm -hmm. but over the course of this book i just want people to feel it sort of seeping into his life and comfort him comforting him in moments when he can't comfort himself or mm. no one else can comfort him and I don't want to have any sort of moral judgment at this point I just want people to feel him say no this is bad and I see the bad, bad effects mm. and by the end of the book see that when he's in a stressful situation this magical flower that his whole town cultivates he'll reach for it because it's mm. it's just sort of like branding it's been there in front yeah. of him forever you know mm. Oh, this is a, this is some powerful stuff. I will ramble and ramble and ramble, <laughs> but really um, in the book, I don't feel it knocks you over the head with that. I no, feel it's no, no, just no. background, and hopefully, this is a nice setup where where Bear is like a very sort of reticent, mm. held in character, and he's not going to always be that. But I just want to sort of set the seeds for mm. for you know where the, the sort of catastrophic catastrophic developments that people sometimes have to go through when these things get inside your brain. Yeah, yeah. This is this is good. <laughs> now, I particularly love that it's a queendom yes. and not a kingdom. Yes. Um. So, was that kind of important for you to kind of have the idea of yeah, there's there's a fiery woman in charge? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. You know what's so funny? I was speaking to an actress. Um. Her name's Harriet Thorpe, and she said a few loads of stuff that always stuck in my mm. head. And I was a young new actor in musicals just after The Wanted. Or a few years after and she said loads of stuff that i'm sure she's forgotten but it's always stuck with me and she said loads of stuff about working class people mm. because she's really educated i think maybe not working class i'm not sure but she was like you know a lot of you working class boys you were raised by working class women you know your dads aren't there all the time you know they're not like running a company and at home yeah they're off mm. and i certainly remember like my 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 gorgeous and hard-working dad raised five kids but he'd be around the country as an electrician mm. and we get the you know weekly phone call to dad mm. so yeah like you get like told off and you get like encouraged and you get embarrassed by your mum and your aunties mm. that are all there all these there's four boys and my little sister so all these like big lads to being raised by this tiny woman like you get inside the house <laughs> that's always been a thing for me so yeah and then and there's multiple um like mentor style older women in this book because that's mm. really like been part of my life as well as my uncles as yes. well you yeah. know i feel like a lot of um a lot of fantasy fiction it's like okay kill off the adults and then the kids are gonna have some fun and yes. save the world mm. but that's not been my experience i think they're like having mentors who tell you stuff that you don't listen to and then 10 years mm. later you go 
I'm old and now they're right, you know? <laughs> that's that's been it part of it. And certainly women have been that for me as well. Like like last like two weeks ago when I had time off, my mum and my aunties all came to watch my play. And then we all had a nice little of course we had a nice little drink in a pub together. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Plus, it's really nice, I think, to see more in books that women are kind of getting more of a voice. Because obviously there's a rich history of fantasy novels where women were, you know, either the the big bad or they were just a sexual object right. to move the plot along. Yeah. Whereas now you just have these, like, amazing women in their own right. Yeah. So. I was really conscious, too, that like, as a male writer, you never want to be one of those male writers that they say, badly written women by men. Yes. And so all you can do is either completely remove gender from your head and just mm. speak from the soul or just draw inspiration from the multitudes of, I mean, you don't, I don't walk through life and only experience dudes, you know, mm. I, we're constantly surrounded by an, a big variety of people. Mm. So hopefully some of those voices, which are like some of the most colourful, interesting and intelligent voices, I can actually, you know, parrot them into mm. life. But I do think about that as a dude, like, oh, I don't want to be one of those guys, you know? <laughs> I remember this, uh, this was a couple of years ago before I was working at FP, and I think they still do it. They used to be a, um, like, bad sex award, and it would be for an oh author writing a really bad sex scene. Right. I won't mention what the book was that won that year, um, but it did say something about a woman's breast being barrel rolled. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> I was like, I used to co-manage an independent bookshop and I was just like... Barrel rolled? How? That's, that, would, that would be like some sort of animal balloon by the end, I yeah. think. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <Just like, laughs> how is... Well, how I have to write that one down. Thing? Yeah, <laughs> just trying to like, <laughs> put it in somewhere. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just amazing, I suppose, what's gone before yeah and what's been published before and it's yeah. just great you know the minute you pick something up so obviously i heard about this book and then uh i saw samantha shannon raving about this book as well ah, so i was like oh, ah, I just, so just like her recommendation gorgeous amazing so, <laughs> yeah you just said like, okay, okay i mean i remember a lot of the fantasy i read as a kid was like now i look back rereading oh yeah it was just always from the guy's perspective and even yes. if there was like a really charming girl she was just there to further his journey or yes. be on his arm and the yeah. rest of it um and even though i really like that those sort of conventional um often an adventure mm. style um books i feel like they can't exist anymore because yeah. they've been done and they were of its time and even though i feel like mine leans really into like that sort of conventional fantasy quest for people that don't read fantasy i think this is like a good step in hopefully if, I, yes. if some of my audiences mm. aren't big fantasy readers i think this is a good not too challenging start um but it cannot be how it used to be the yeah. world has changed so much for the better mm. and and it's gotta it's gotta yeah. exist that way you know there's no other there's no other way yeah. no definitely we have to of course talk about the magic system yes and it's just like i momentarily forgot that you used to be in a boy band <laughs> and then you're just like but the ma magic system is all kind of rhythm based. Do you know what's stuff, so funny? So, yeah. I, I didn't, people have said like a million, you know, different things, their responses to it. And it's so weird to sort of think about all these influences in my life just going out in, in this. Mm. None of it feels intentional. It just feels, it felt like just writing and what's the adventure and where mm. does it start and who are going to do it. But yeah, absolutely. I feel like anything like to do with music and meditation, to me, they're quite close to what, it, what could possibly be magic. No, I guess like scientists are probably on the other end. Yes. But if we're kind of trying to do it all through intuition, which is when I imagine magic in the real world, I think, oh, it must be some sort of intuitive mm. release or yeah. connection. It had to be driven through that. And I think music, music is that for everyone. I think I know everyone will hear a song that they heard when they were like going through a breakup and they'll be like, ah. or <laughs> when they were 18 and be like, this is the best song ever, you know? <laughs> You see, like, I've seen so many beautiful videos of people that are really um, sort of end stage of their life in hospital and they hear a song that's from the 40s mm. and they're just sparkle in their eyes. So I think music is like a time capsule of a moment and that is magic. Yeah. So yeah, that is in there. And, and then I think too, like, for me, magic is, would be natural. So the way that in this system, people sort of go into a meditative state, focus on beats, Kind of like a lot of people do like sound bowls, and I always think sound bowls <laughs> sound so pretentious. <laughs> but you know, a sort of vi a vibration, I totally get it. And then they sort of enlace their mind, their mind's eye with these plants, and then can sort of bloom them at will. Mm. A 
I thought it just sounded like more a more naturalistic way versus like when I think of like sort of witches versus wizards wizards mm. being really like academic and university and you have to add this and then do that and wave the wand and say those words whereas witches feel more like okay so these herbs this part of the earth mm. you know feels more organic I wanted it to feel like that for now yeah for now <laughs> that's it <what's laughs> Because we, we've definitely seen a resurgence, I think, of kind of witchcraft in books, uh, films and stuff of late. We've definitely seen a rise on people buying books about witchcraft. And I, I think maybe it's kind of anti-technology and people are getting a bit fed up of kind of being followed everywhere. Like, right. You can't, like, obviously Instagram, you know, X, whatever else, like... I think people are just trying to get back to a simpler time. Yeah, I think there's something with technology that like exhausts the mind's eye. Yeah. I mean, there are ways of watching telly for hours and you're fine. But really, I mean, those marathons are fun. But after a while, you're like, I need to see a tree. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you just need to go and suddenly like your head clears. I think the phone can be so exhausting. Mm. I'm such a demon for the phone because it's so endlessly yeah, entertaining. Scrolling, it like... just... <laughs> There's some weird and wonderful people out there. Like, what are they making now? Ooh, you know, like, it really is so entertaining. But by the end of, like, a, a long day of phone scrolling, you feel ill. Yeah. Whereas if you read a book or paint or literally just... I've been, so I've been out of, like, fitness since COVID. Right. But during this play, um, one of my, one of my uh, co-players... Co I can't word good right now. <laughs> One of my fellow actors is uh, really into these park runs. So every week oh, I've been doing a 5K okay. run and I just feel alive because it's yeah. not just the fact that I'm running, it's also running through parks and yes. trees and seeing yeah. nature and sort of like washes away the dirt of technology, you know? It really does. Yeah, no, definitely. It does make a difference. I actually got into running recently. My boyfriend has run like marathons and stuff. Yeah, I know and the I, type. They yeah. just like. Yeah, he's Slow just, down. he could just power. Right. And then I'm just like... Puffing and puffing at the back. <laughs> next thing. Um, and I, I, like, you do, I've done, like, spin and yoga and stuff, and I enjoy that. But I think there's something about running, like you said, you can just, you can kind of do it anywhere. You can yeah. find a park wherever you are. So you're on tour, and you can just, like, yeah. right, I'm going to go for a run. Um, it's free. <laughs> so you're yeah. not paying some exorbitant, like, gym membership. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, I can imagine that you know it's good for focus so for the next books right yeah it's plans <laughs> in action uh, <laughs> so we have to talk about um it's so tricky because you don't want to kind of say too many spoilers for people that i'll trust you to it do out. it however you choose <laughs> but um we have to talk about the uh, the blots yes where the idea of so I knew that I wanted there to be scary things in the forest mm. because what fantasy novel doesn't want scary things in the forest yes. and to me I was trying to work out what really scared me and something that always stuck with me I can't remember where I heard it but someone said if you look out a window at night and someone says oh there's a wolf outside mm. I wouldn't be scared even though wolves are pretty terrifying yeah or can be mm. or even a bear but mm. dude there's glass here they've got no chance but if someone just said there's a man standing outside in the garden mm at night I'll go oh my gosh what is he doing there help call the police so I knew I wanted them to be humanoid in that way mm. and um I was speaking to Samantha Shannon at Waterstones thing in Michigan uh, yes. and she was she said they remind me of zombies do you feel like they're zombieish? I went you know what zombies I love 28 days later oh, yes. 28 days later and she went terrified as I was reading it I was thinking these are like the 28 days later <laughs> zombies and despite the fact they're not <clears throat> like the undead they are creatures in their own right and they've got canine teeth mm. um they are like high speed um, predators, humanoid fast runners, and thankfully they only come out at night. Mm. But I just, I was just thinking what genuinely would scare me? And you know, sharks in water, terrifying. Mm -hmm. Sharks on land, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> on land, it's all about the scary men chasing you, I think. Yeah, yeah there is something more frightening about yeah, a humanoid kind of, there's a thing about if there was a beast you know kind of chasing you or something it it feels otherworldly and therefore i think it'd be easier or i like to think it'd be easier for you to kill the big bad but if it's humanoid yeah and you're wondering that's about its intelligence and terrifying yeah definitely yeah so humans where they scary what, yeah humans are scary <laughs> <laughs> 
Are you a zombie fan, by the way? Yeah, I mean, like... I've watched In and Out of The Walking Dead, but I'm, yeah. I mean, I die hard love 28 Days Later, mm-hmm. Shaun of the Dead, yes. which I, actually is a classic zombie yes. movie. Um, I think, oh, I played, uh, what's the one with the little girl? Oh, um, uh, not... Last of Us. Yeah, yeah Last, Last of Us. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was that series that had um, sort of mushroom, the, the, the mushroom version, the TV version of that series. Yes. The Mushroom Meat, that yes. was amazingly done. Yes, yes. So yeah, I would ne- I've, I've never thought of myself as a big zombie guy, but I have huge affection for zombies. 28 Weeks Later was pretty good. 28 Days Later was like a magic Because I think they're though. doing a new they are. film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone Which testing. <laughs> I, I can't run very like fast. Early days. <laughs> yeah, it could be a shambler or something. <laughs> yeah, like exactly that. that. Um, but yeah, that there is something. I'm a huge uh, Resident Evil fan, and I grew oh, up yeah, yeah, playing yeah. the old school games and stuff. And yeah, there is something about the idea of it's someone you recognise. Oh yeah. Who's turned and whether you would be able to kill them? Kill them. That's kill hard. Them. That one. That's yeah. always hard. So I, I think about the blots in your book. It, it they're just extra scary because yeah. <laughs> Zombie-ish. <laughs> Zombie-ish. Oh. Um, so the last couple of questions for our interview today. So um, we have to talk about what you're working on next. So obviously you've got many other projects going on. So what's your kind of immediate and then what's your sort of long term? So, I mean, my immediate and long term are all bound together at, mm-hmm. at this point. So I'm on tour with the play 222 ghost story it's scary it's doing really well like we have a nice full audiences and they're screaming and laughing um it's so fun to be part of um you met my manager damien we went and watched <laughs> it like six months ago with a different cast and we sat there and i was like i need this job please 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 <laughs> and i've never done a, a play without i've never done a non-musical play mm. so but thankfully thankfully it all went well and i'm really enjoying being in that but while we're going around the uk and we're a week in every mm. different town and i'm taking ridiculous amounts of pictures of architecture and pubs everywhere we go um i'm also uh, writing a second one as we go ah, so wow. it's all kind of yeah. symbiotic and that's taking me all the way up till june is the mm-hmm. end of the tour and fun fact really fun fact that i'm looking forward to in a couple of weeks um whenever i can just because oh, i'm doing hotels airbnbs mm-hmm. whatever as we go i'm going to stay in the canal boats for a few other weeks because oh, cool. at the end of the book um some characters head off on this black canal boat with three mm-hmm. witches and the second book is basically following their adventure throughout wherever they go mm-hmm. in the rest of the queendom and i've been on a canal boat holiday as a teenager with like my massive family it was like a burnt in memory of happiness <laughs> and so i just can't wait to get in one and just chug around and then every evening i'll go off and do a play and make people scream and then come back and be like that's my plan. Doesn't that sound like That's a dream? That's so idyllic. I'm so yeah. happy. I just wish I had a dog. So yeah, you need, to, need to work could on you that. Do like, don't they do like rent a dog <laughs> type thing? You could just have a dog for the week. Um, a I'm week. a rent a dog kind of person. <laughs> I need that right now. <laughs> yeah, just like so, yeah, someone waiting for you on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite sweet. Um, I know a, a friend of mine who's a, a book agent actually lives in a canal boat with her fiance. Oh, stuff, amazing. And, and she absolutely adores it so the only the one downside is when you have to empty the sewage <laughs> i remember so. that from touring days but, I, but it was the tour bus and thankfully oh, oh. that wasn't my job <laughs> yeah. sorry about that <laughs> it's just like just leave that yeah um and so to finish off the interview today what are you currently reading watching and if you game or are you playing Okay, um, no games right now. The, uh, I, I just was thinking again about playing all the Shadow of Mordor ones. Ah, um, just cause... but not the bad Gollum one, don't you? Oh, is it bad? No. Oh, no. Don't, don't do it. Um, and then, what is that damn... So I've just started, I'm on the first chapter, Samantha Shannon's book, The Giant One with the Blue Dragon on the Front. Oh yeah, Day of Fallen Night. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I asked her, she, she, uh, we're at this the giant one doesn't narrow it down. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I said, sh- she had two, and she was like, okay, which one would you like? And I said, which one would you recommend? And she said, this is my most well-known, this is my favourite. And I was like, give me that favourite right now. <laughs> and I just read the first, I think I'm on the second chapter or something, and I'm just immediately like, this is so beautiful, it's so gorgeous the way she writes. Going to be stealing a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's what I'm reading right now. Yeah. So that'll be me on a canal boat, just flicking through Samantha Shannon's worlds, doing a little play, book two. Oh my god, and that, and yeah, that takes me through till summer, that's and then we'll see cool. what happens, I've come out blinking in the 
English yeah. sunlight. Then then you get a break. You get a small, <laughs> small <laughs> yeah. break to chill. Just a day or two. Yeah. I know um, we've been actually talking upstairs because a, uh, a couple of my colleagues upstairs are also huge about the Shannon vans. And we were just saying, when does she find time? When yeah. does she have time off? I think she has, um, <laughs> what was it called when Hermione uh, had the time turner thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, she got yeah, one of those. Yeah. She's she, going she back must, and... She must do. Or Bernard's watch. Yeah. <laughs> She's using one of those for sure. <laughs> well, we obviously wish you every success with Thanks, uh, thanks for having um, me. I really, really enjoyed so it. So pleased that you've been able to come in and that we can go, go sign a load, a load of stuff like that. So... But thank you everyone tuning in at home. There'll be signed copies available on forbiddenplanet.com and in all currently eight of our stores and hopefully our Bristol store will be reopening real soon. But we'll let you know. See you soon. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.